What does it take to stand out in a crowded marketplace? Our guest today is William Vanderblumen. He is the founder of the Vanderblumen Search Group, which specializes in executive search and in particular, finding and placing star leaders, otherwise known as unicorns. He is the author of the HarperCollins leadership book, Be the Unicorn, which unpacks 12 data-driven habits that separate the best leaders from the rest. And so I'm excited to have him here today so we can talk about this subject and help you to be the unicorn that you're capable of being. So welcome, uh, William. We're glad to have you here today. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. And before we start, I want to do a shout out to Forche uh, PR uh, because they're the ones that uh, introduced us. So thank you to them and their team. I just so appreciate all of the podcast agencies that send us amazing guests. And of course, our listeners and viewers for tuning in because you're the reason why we're here. So thank you uh, for being here. So, uh, William, let's talk about this uh, journey that you've been on because you were a sure. pastor and now you're one of the foremost experts in executive search. How, how did that, how did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a uh, long windy road and I'll try and keep it short, but you did ask a recovering preacher an open-ended question. So sorry about that. <laughs> Could be a minute. <laughs> <laughs> give me a, give me a hot minute. Right. Oh um, yeah. So I was a pastor. I was always like as a kid, serial entrepreneur i mean always starting things like we could spend a whole podcast talking about all the different little businesses that i started and uh you know newspaper routes and it, lots and lots of starting things up um but then after a, a, a lot of bad behavior in college <laughs> like typical you know idiot prodigal type behavior um faith got important to me and then I felt like I probably needed to go into the pastorate and try and pass the same thing along. So, uh, frankly, I was probably always a little too entrepreneurial to be in some of the churches that I serve because churches, you know, don't really do new ideas all that well. I probably should have started a church somewhere, but uh, nonetheless, had had a really great career on it. Uh, ended up at, at a in that field. I was young, so I was thirty one and asked to come lead the First Presbyterian Church in Houston, which is where Sam Houston went to church. It's kind of the oldest church in the city. Big deal. I was I, I was in so far over my head. I was, uh, oh my gosh, I was not prepared. I mean, I think, honestly, uh, Nicole, the biggest thing I had going for me was I was 31, so I, I knew everything. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I did that for about six years. And um, then... Uh, went through a divorce, which I wouldn't recommend. Uh, it wasn't even, you know, anything tabloids would have wanted to pay attention to, but it was just uh, kind of a fault on all sides sort of thing. And um, I found myself as a single dad with four kids. And so I went into the business world um, and went to work for a large oil and gas company, a uh, large Fortune 200, you know, about the same size as Starbucks in market cap. And the CEO had been there nine years and I was on a management rotation track. So the, the year that I got there, they put me in HR. Okay, learn this for a year and then we'll move you around. Um, the CEO said, okay, I've been here nine years and that's a lifetime for a company that size. Um, it's time to find my successor. And so they hired this thing called a search firm. Never heard such thing. 90 days later, they had their new CEO. I thought, wow. Because see, the... Uh, it's not, it didn't work that way in the church world. The uh, First Presbyterian Church of Houston, arguably one of the top three or four Presbyterian churches in the country, um, you know, shouldn't be a hard role to fill. They took three years to find me. I was there six years. They took three years to find the next guy. Wow. So tw 12 years, half with a leader, half looking, and everybody just thought that was normal. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, what, this is ridiculous, the inefficiency in this thing that I do love. Um, so I, I went home. Adrian and I had gotten married in the spring, and this was the end of the summer. Uh, so we hadn't been married very long at all. We just blended our family. We had a house we could barely afford. Uh, you know, um, And I came home and said, I think, Adrian, I think I'm supposed to quit my job and start something new for churches. And she just looked at me and said, 
well, that's because churches love new ideas, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> Smart if lady. Familiar, if you're familiar with churches, then you know that that's funny. If you're not familiar with churches, uh, look at a cross with, with Jesus hanging on it. That's what happens to new ideas in the church. <laughs> So, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. And Nicole, the best, the, maybe the best part of the story. It was uh, the end of the summer and beginning of the fall of 2008, which, if you remember oh, wow. your yeah. economics, that was just a brilliant time to quit your job and start something new. So, long With time a million ago, kids and a million kids. Yep. And yeah. But uh, I, we didn't know if it'd be a full time thing. We didn't know if it worked. Started on a card table, didn't take out any debt, didn't do investors, just built it out and uh, it, it, it kind of took off. And now, now it's like we started, Oh, can we help a church find their pastor? But now you've got schools that need headmasters. You've got relief organizations, giant relief organizations and nonprofits that need a CEO. And, and surprisingly, surprisingly at first, but now I understand a whole lot of sort of values based businesses are coming to us saying, help us find our top talent. Like it's like a, uh, you know, really large uh, family-owned business that makes a drill bit and they're going toward third gen and none of the grandkids want to take it over and they're going to need to get a new CEO, but there's a way they like to do things that's not just competency-based. It's it's the why behind it. So we're getting hired for a lot of that now. But that, Wow, that was a long answer. So it's been a long winding road, but uh, gotten a lot of uh, fun on the job training. And I guess after 16 years, that starts to get some interest added to it. Yes. Yes. Well, you, you wrote this book called be the unicorn. And as I read it, it's interesting. The, the arena that you operate in or started out at least operating in now it's kind of expanded, but it's a very, when you talk about unicorns, it's not really something that you talk about in the nonprofit or the church community. That's really a business term. And when I was reading through it, you know, talking about fast or agile or, you know, like these are not things that, like you said, it's not, it's not something that's in those industries. So, but your that's what your book is about. So tell us why you wrote that book and who it's actually for. Yeah. Well, as mentioned, the company's just been, we've been very blessed. Every single year has been a record year on, I think every dashboard that we look at, we've just been very, very fortunate. And then we we did this pandemic thing. Oh, that, and it, that was a different year. That was not a record year because every one of our clients closed indefinitely. <laughs> you yes. Know? You know, like Zoom grew like crazy. Amazon grew. We were not that. We were the part of the world that was shut down. Nobody's hiring. And it's like, oh, my gosh, what are we going to do? And we had a, a I decided very early on, I read an article a friend sent me, so I can't take credit for it. The article said, uh, should you view this as a this shutdown, as a, a, a blizzard? It was called Leading Beyond the Blizzards. Fabulous article. Should you see this as a blizzard? We're shut down for a couple of weeks. You should decide if you think this is more like a long winter. We're shut down for a couple months. Or maybe it's a mini ice age and we're going to be out of balance for at least a year and a half. We decided on that early we had to reduce our overhead by 40% in one day to get right sized for that. And, and our overhead is not like material goods, it's people. So it was really, really bad. And even after cutting that far down, we still had a lot of extra time. So we served a lot of our clients during that time, helping them get PPP. And we also were able, because we weren't growing so fast, we we're able to take a look at our work like get, get away from the work enough to look at what you've done. And we realized we've always wondered if we could spot the best talent faster, we'd be a better search firm, right? So we asked the question, do our very best people have anything in common? The best interviews we've ever done. And, and so we looked at finalists, okay? And their long format interview that all finalists get. And we've now done 30,000 of those finalist interviews, all unicorns. And we've followed their careers and we've seen how they did in the interview and we've noticed. So um, it, it's sort of a 15 year research project that I didn't even know I was doing. But when you've got 30,000 top talented people, you can say, what do they have in common? 
And I thought we were just doing a study so we could do our job better. But, but what I found was the answer to the question is, yes, they do have something in common. In fact, we found 12 things they have in common, and they're all teachable habits. They're not what I would have. I would have thought the best of the best all had a super high IQ. That'd be the common, you know, or they all came from families with enough means to send them to a really great education or they're tall and good looking or what, or, or, or more women than men or men than women, or this, uh, these 12 habits come across every line, socioeconomic, racial, ethnic, gender. And when we realize they're teachable habits, we're like, you know, now we got to get this in the hands of people because they can develop their career. And that's why we, you know, decided to write Be the Unicorn. And we wrote it very intentionally toward people that are trying to stand out or get ahead. Um, I guess if you're hiring, it could also be a benefit because you can learn to spot talent faster. But uh, just fascinating. We, we interviewed, we surveyed all 30,000. We surveyed a quarter million of the general population so we could compare and contrast. And it, it was sort of our nerd out project during the lockdown. Wow. Well, I mean, when I looked at these 12, and I I have to say, I do relate to all of them or most of them. I mean, where I could see it like, oh, yeah, like this and that. And, you know, it's uh, it's fascinating. I mean, what a what a blessing. There's a lesson in this is that oftentimes, like you said about that article, oftentimes when things happen and we saw that, right, people were like, oh, well, you know, let me figure out what's on Netflix to watch. You know, it's like, wait, what? There is so much happening right now, so much potential. So you can look at it like a setback and you can look at it also as an opportunity. And so many yeah. people wrote books, discovered things in the process because they had this opportunity to step out for a moment, whether That's it right. was forced or not, but they got an opportunity to step out and look at what they were doing and reconsider that. And it's just so powerful. And so I'd love for you to share a little bit about the different types, maybe some of your favorites, maybe some of the ones yeah. that, that uh, you know, you see in yourself or that you see most, uh, most uh, commonly. And then I'd yeah. love to talk also about entrepreneurs who are listening. How do they use this book to help yeah. them stand out, you know, even if they're not looking for a job? Well, and it's not even really, uh, Nicole, it's not just stand out. I mean, you know, it's really more of a mindset. It's a way of being. Yeah. I mean, you, I, you know, you go to a social event, you'll see some people who their outfit stands out, but you would never want to, <laughs> you would never want to be in it. <laughs> I'm talking about like, have you ever met somebody and within five minutes you're like, Oh, this one's special. Oh, hundred percent. That yeah. kind of stands out. So if you're an entrepreneur, well, what if it, it, maybe you're talking to investors about your entrepreneurial idea? What can you do so that when you meet with an investor, you stand out that, oh, wow, Nicole's special, right? Or when you're interviewing, or if you're an entrepreneur and you're building a team, how do you interview to determine whether or not this person is just winsome or if they really are a unicorn? So I, I think there are a lot of ways uh, the book can be utilized, whether you're on the I'm trying to get ahead or I'm trying to build a team of people that will get ahead so that when anybody comes to our company, Everyone that talks to one of our people walks away saying, everyone I met, there's just something, they're, they're different, they're special. So, yeah. 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 I, uh, you asked about a few habits. Um, the first habit in the book is probably one of my favorites, maybe because it's one I default toward, it's one I'm stronger in. Um, it's called The Fast. And, you know, it's funny, um, you say you read these and you recognize all these things. If you read, if you read the chapter titles, the fast, the solvers, the you know, the innovators. The it, if you read them all, you're going to say, William, I could have come up with this. This looks like what was the old book? Everything I needed to know I learned before kindergarten or in kindergarten or what? Um, but it's it's not that. It frankly, the running joke in the office was if they won't let us use the word unicorn, we'll just call it. Oh wow, I guess mom was right. Because most of these things are things I heard my mother telling me I needed to do. Uh, yeah. And one of them is you need to get back to people. Like, yes, you need to write a thank you note when you get a gift, William. I, I, I'll still get the text from my mother. Don't let my mom listen to this podcast because I'll get the text saying, you know, I, did, I was just checking to see if your birthday gift arrived. I hadn't heard anything. 
You know, it's <laughs> funny great. because it's like old school etiquette. That's right. And, and you know, um, I think that for a number of very valid reasons, I think younger generations don't have any training in that. Don't even know how to answer an email. Like, yeah, we just hosted an event for a younger group. I won't out who it was, but you know, they were supposed to RSVP to Adrian about whether they were going to come there or not. And the, the RSVP that she got from one of them said, Hey girl. And then and it's like, <laughs> <laughs> but this is not a book about etiquette. Really, the 12 habits boil down to 12 very intentional ways that unicorns treat other humans that most of the rest of us don't bother to do. And one of those is the fast. You say, what do you mean the fast? What are they doing to people? Are we running? I'm not fast, William. I'm not even a runner. It's not talking about that kind of speed. Uh, we're talking about intentional responsiveness right? So it is a thanks so much for the gift or more, uh, more poignantly that lead came in. I better give them a sales call right away. And what we discovered is unicorns are, are just almost, almost OCD about this. The first chance they get, they return a call. And, and if you look at the effectiveness of this, so like there's a, a study that we reference in the book, that um, I won't tell you the whole book, but this study was, okay, let's see, does response time matter in sales calls? Okay, so you get a lead in, say it's uh, fill out a form on our website and somebody will contact you. Okay, you fill out the form, please have somebody contact me. How much does response time affect the likelihood of getting a call? Okay, uh, the study, which was tens of thousands of companies that use the sort of fill out a form thing, found that if, if, if a form comes in and you respond intentionally, not an AI chatbot, but human response, if you respond within uh, 60 seconds, you have over 98% of a chance of talking to that person. If, wow. you, wait, if you wait 20 minutes, it drops to 60%. Which, I mean, you've probably done this. You're on email. You fill out the form. If somebody gets back to you while you're still at your keyboard or on your phone or whatever, you're going to go, wow. But yeah. 20 minutes from now, I might be on to my next thing and not have my phone out or be on the keyboard or what have you. Uh, if you wait, it, there were lots of de declines. But if you wait 24 hours to get back to a lead that came in, you have a less than 1% chance of ever talking to that person. Which is interesting because when you think about how many companies have a, we'll get back to you in 24 hours. And they don't. And average they don't. response yeah. time, the average response time of a salesperson when a lead came in was 42 hours. Yeah. So and they wonder why they're not successful. Right. Mm -hmm. And these are people, I mean, think about this for a second, Nicole. Salespeople, unless you've got some deal I don't know about, salespeople get paid by selling stuff. So they're like directly motivated to want this to work. I mean, we saw, we, we talked to, do you, I, I'm going to tell my age with this. You remember the, the company eHarmony? Yes. Like way before people were swiping left or right, the OG of the dating and the internet was eHarmony. And they were, they told us um, the response time when we send profiles, people saying, you should get with this person, you should read. People wait, lonely people that want a relationship. <laughs> Don't. If you just get back to people, you will get noticed. Yeah. And, and I, I credit that one trait with what made the difference in getting our business going. And, and, and it wasn't because I was smart or capable. It was because I figured out really fast, oh, no, I just quit my job. If I don't sell things, we don't eat. And I would get back to people like mad and, and still do if I can. Um, and, and, you know, even to this day, it's like, golly, y'all got back to us right away. Nobody does that. This is also why this is the first chapter of the book. Because what we found is we've, we've got the 12 habits, not, not William's 12 opinions, 12 data proven habits that will cause you to stand out in the crowd. It, it, it's almost like we uncovered how to build the treadmill that really will get you in the best shape of your life if you'll use it, right? And now we're to the part where you've got to use it. So implementing change in your life 
uh, I'm a believer that the best way to create life change is to make small changes that you can see results fast. I think that, that you know, discipline creates momentum in change and the momentum fuels more discipline and it just creates a flywheel. So we wanted to put the easiest one first. This is not, just do it, do it. Just yeah. get back to people. So that, that's it. probably my favorite and why it's first. It's interesting though, that even though, like you said, the salespeople, they get paid when they sell something, the person who is lonely connects to somebody, that's what they're there for. And yet there is something within us. And I think this is where this highlights it, that something within us, it challenges that fear. It challenges the resistance inside us to, yes. to get beyond that and to actually just take the action that's needed versus getting all, all up in our head. So, you know, my experience is even like when I get an email and if I don't respond like right away, yep. there's like a heaviness to it and it gets, you know, like you have that task and you put it just off gets and you put it yep. off and it just gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And it's like this huge thing now, this huge weight to, to, yeah. to, you know, to handle. And yet when you do it, it takes like five minutes, 20 minutes, yep. whatever, and it's done. And it's like, oh my gosh, you feel so amazing. But how many of us, how many people who are, let's say even like the, the, the non-unicorns, soon to be unicorns are going to listen to this. They're going to make some changes, but that they're, that they're putting things off and then wondering why they're not successful. I had somebody who is a client, I, I coach entrepreneurs. And so um, there was this new entrepreneur, she wanted to start her business. And she said, I want to get into like, you know, presentation training, corporate training and all of that. And, uh, and I, so I was asking her about like what her plan was and who she was going to call, who she had and, you know, that she could, she could reach out to. And she was like, well, I'm committed this week. I'm going to make five calls. And I said, five, like, what are you going to do with the other 50 hours? Yeah. 49 hours. Yeah, 49 hours of, like, hello, <laughs> what the heck? I said, I, I have, I'm going to tell you this, some hard truth here. That is not going to cut it. It's not going to cut it. You're not going to make it. That's right. And it's that on, it's kind of like that entrepreneur to, you know, versus the employee mindset. The employee mindset is you show up, you put your time in, but even there, right? Companies are looking for unicorns. They're looking for those stars. You may get yeah. a job, but it doesn't mean you're going to stand out or move up in the ranks, well, you and, know, and with you that know, kind of not, attitude. We're not even uh, talking about like the, the need to stand out is, is bigger than ever. This is the first time in U.S. history we've got five different generations crowded into the workforce. So you've got mm -hmm. people who are sitting there saying they won't listen to me because I'm the old geezer. You've got people saying the old boys won't listen to me because I'm too young or I'm a woman or I'm a man. And it's all crowded, crowded, crowded. And, and it's Gen X and it's Gen Y and it's Gen Z. And there's a sixth generation. No one wants to talk about Gen AI that is going to disrupt work. What, what yeah, that talk actually, about that. Mm -hmm. Well, what's so interesting about these 12 habits is AI can't do any of them. They're all human to human skills. Right. I mean, you've been contacted by a chat bot responding to you. And you, I mean, we all know it's. Yeah, it's not human. And, and one thing that I believe for a long time and we saw in the pandemic is humans were not meant to be alone. Like, no, that's true. Mental health crisis that came out of that pandemic. We're still in the ripples of it. And a lot of it is because we were not made to be alone. The human heart craves human interaction. So AI is coming. And I mean, I guess, I guess you could say, and maybe, maybe this is what it is. We're in the prequel of the Terminator. You know, it's just a matter of time. The machines will rise. And yeah, if that's the case, then why get uptight at all? We all die. And that's all, you know, <laughs> I, I don't think that's where it's going. I think what's going to happen is AI is going to automate more and more of the workflow and the piece that humans will bring to the uh, table that will be valued is human to human skill. Yeah. And these 12 habits will not be replicated by a machine. So it's, it's crowded now. And people are like, how do I stand out? I don't even know what to do. And everybody's got a podcast and everybody's got a LinkedIn profile and everybody looks great online. It's crowded now, but just the next few years, it's going to get more and more and more crap, harder to stand out. 
And as workforces change, I can tell you during the pandemic, we had to cut a lot of people, but uh, the lead team sat down and said, um, make a list of people you can't live without. And we all have the same list. We all have the same list. Yeah. And it wasn't like we had good people and bad people. We had all good people. But when it came down to saying, who are the ones we really like? They can't. We all had the same list. It was weird. We made out our list completely set. You know why? Because there is something that, that business owners notice about employees that function in these 12 habits. And if you're worried that your job's going to get replaced, build these 12 habits out. You won't, You might have a different job title or responsibilities, but you're not going to get thrown out. Not unless we all get thrown out. Well, and even if they are in a different position, they won't care because they're more right. about the bigger picture The and they have That's the right. agility to be able to, the problem solving and all of that, to be able to to navigate. And sometimes, um, I, I, I oftentimes I'll, I'll be talking to people that are, they're stuck in like this, I know how to do this. This is my job. Yeah, this was my job. Yep. And now I need to get you know, another job doing that. And it's like, well, wait a second, let's step yep. out, look at the transferable skills, look at the, I mean, you can put certain people and I'll put myself in that included. It's like, you can put me in any position and I'm, and I'm going to, I'm going to figure it out. Right. Because there's the transferable, you, the same thing, right. There's the transferable skills. And I love what you said there about, they're not that you can't live without them because those people, those are the people it's like the, I think of the waiter or the waitress or the, you know, the person who's like in some kind of service role and, you know, they, they meet somebody that's a founder of a company and the, and they see that customer service, they see those skills, whether they recognize them as those specific habits or not, but they see those habits in them and they say, I want to hire you. And I don't even know for what, you know, and, and uh, they all I, get, I, uh, yeah, go ahead. Our, our uh, oldest got married last weekend. Okay. Uh, just three, four days ago. And after we hang up on this call, I have a call scheduled with the person that was the wedding director. And this was up in Maryland. This wasn't even here uh, for that very reason. I'm like, Amber, we got to talk. I, I, I want to talk to you about coming to work here. And she's like, what do your company do? <laughs> yeah. We had, we had a uh, guest on this show. She stood out. She yeah. stood out. I could see it. I, you know. Yes. That's the thing. It, it's we had a guest on this show, um, Stephen Dosu, and he came from a little town, Tongo, in in Africa, and made his way, you know, walking, train, whatever, when he was young to get to uh, uh, South Africa to Cape Town, and he is selling apples. He tells the story how he's selling apples. He doesn't know anything. He comes from like dirt floor upbringing, right? He's selling apples in the market and he's like, these are the best apples. These are going to change your life. You take them home to your wife. She's going to love you. The whole thing, right? Guy says, I got a job for you. He goes, okay. So he, his pastor gives him some, some clothes to wear to the interview the next day. He shows up. He has no idea who, what, any details. He's like, he just said, yes. So he shows up. He walks in the door and the lady says, yeah, you're hired. And he goes, great, <laughs> what are we going to do? What are we doing? And he says, you're going to sell, you're going to sell vacuum cleaners. He goes, great. What are vacuum cleaners? Because he had never <laughs> seen one. So he starts selling these vacuum cleaners. And then from there, about like six months later, he's now managing an area. He's got 300 people he's responsible for. And, you know, the, the rest is history. But, but, that's, that, but that's the point. Anyone yeah. can be a unicorn. I think most unicorns, either by really good training from a parent or some intuitive sort of, I bet if I do this, it'll work. Like they sort of have to figure it out. But now we have the roadmap. Now, yes. now there's like no excuses and it, it can look like it it could be the guy that didn't want a vacuum cleaner is it could be amber that helped run a rehearsal dinner and a wedding reception my my girl scout cookie salesman okay uh she's awesome she uh first came to us i mean we, our our little town is full of entrepreneurs for, it's just a weird little neighborhood and so we're all like you know we all kind of built our own thing and and uh we're all pulling for the Girl Scout salesman and the lemonade stands do real well in our neighborhood. And, you know, so that this new Girl Scout cookie 
person shows up. Charlotte. Hello. Hello, my name's Charlotte. Hi, Mr. Fairblum. Hi, Mr. Fairblum. Will you buy some cookies for me? And her dad's back on the sidewalk. He's not helping her, you know. He's watching. And I said, Charlotte. And I got down where I was on eye level to try to, you know. Have you ever gone to that place, Tiny's Milk and Cookies? Oh, yes, sir, Mr. Fairblum. I said, is that not just the best chocolate chip cookie? She said, yeah, that's a really good cookie. I said, okay, Charlotte. If I walk out of my house and walk about 300 yards down that sidewalk, I'm at Tiny's Milk and Cookies. Why should I buy a cookie from you when I can go get that cookie? Her eyes get big. Her dad's, you know, kind of dying, laughing back on the sidewalk. And she says, we have more flavors. It's true because they only sell a chocolate chip cookie. Oh, and, and so, so that's so, okay. So I'll sign up next year. She shows up, Mr. Van Blumen. Let's talk about the brand new flavors we have at the Girl Scout. Kids. So she's like learning, right? She's building on the and Mr. Van Blumen, I want to tell you the new flavor you should not buy. I, I, I mean, don't buy the vegan Girl Scout cookie, it's not very good. <laughs> the next year she shows up. Knocks on the door. Mr. Evelyn, do you know about the mission of the Girl Scouts? This year on Christmas Day, she left me the three boxes that I bought as a Christmas present and a form to pre-order before they sell out <laughs> on Christmas Day. That's awesome. So nine years old, a total unicorn. Don't even know what a vacuum cleaner is. Total unicorn. Did a wedding reception when it was cold and blustery. Total unicorn. It, anyone can do these things. It's just whether or not you'll actually use the treadmill. Yeah. Oh, I love this. And I love the fact that you keep emphasizing that anyone can do this because it's not like the exclusive. A lot of times in the startup world, you think of unicorns is that Steve Jobs, you know, Jeff Bezos type of uh, person. And what you have done is you've basically have codified what it is that they did fundamentally the habits that they applied that allowed them to do the things that they uh, do in that in is in any industry so that is that is fantastic well william thank you so much for sharing a little yeah. bit about your book and your story and your experience and uh, i hope it encourages people today you know to uh, uh, not only get your book, so we'll make sure that's in the show notes, Be the Unicorn, sure. 12 Data-Driven Habits That Separate the Best Leaders from the Rest. Uh, we'll make sure your website, of course, to uh, your executive search firm is in the show notes as well. Do you have any final thoughts for our-, our uh... Yeah, just one, one little, uh, I made a, a deal with myself some years back that I wasn't going to write another book. This is the fifth one I've done. Um, I wasn't going to write another book without providing a resource to help people apply the book. So we built a software tool for the last couple of books. We built a software tool for this one. It's at vanderindex.com where you can kind of take an assessment and see how do I measure up against the unicorns and what are my three best and what are my three worst? And if you want to do it as a team, there's a 360 way where your boss can take it about you and the people that work for you. There's, there's, we want people to be able to apply this. So um, go to vanderindex.com and check that out. And then hopefully by the fall, it might be January, February, we'll have a workbook out for teams as well. So fantastic. Oh, I love that. And I'm actually going to start applying that with clients as well, because, you know, they're all entrepreneurs and they all need to yeah. learn that and also for building teams. So fantastic. I'll add that to my uh, shortlisted repertoire of uh, assessments that I use for, for people. Yeah. That's fantastic. William, thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure and uh, I, I really, really enjoyed it. And I'm inspired. I'm inspired because if we can help people to, I mean, we talk about leaders, you know, that are transforming the world around them. You got to be a unicorn to be able to do that. That Those are the That's ones right. that transform the world. They're curious. That's one of the, the, the traits. That's right. You know, they, they move fast. They problem solve. They're agile. This is, these are, that this is who the leaders of transformation are. That's right. So, so I'm going to say to our, our audience out there, Leaders of transformation, take action. I say it almost every time. So yep. take action on something today. Go to that vanderindex.com and do your own assessment and figure out what are your strengths, 
What are the ones you're strong in? What are the ones that maybe you're lacking? Maybe you got some work to do. Maybe maybe it's taking 12. And I actually happen to like the fact that there are 12, not that you need to wait a whole year to develop them all. But what if you took one a month and you started to develop and master those skills and saying, I'm going to just do that this month. And I'm going to focus in and get really good at that. And then I'm going to go the next month and I'm going to build on it and build on it and build on it. And uh, what a difference that will be for you in one year from now. So I encourage you to do that. We'd love to hear your stories. Of course, you can go on leadersoftransformation.com. You can reach out to us there. You can find us on social. We'd love to hear how this has impacted you and how we can support you in being a leader of transformation. So uh, thanks again for being here. And we look forward to seeing you next week on another episode. Have a great day. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you.